Hi, and welcome to our For All the Fragility podcast, where together with our guests from around the globe, we look at how fragility manifests across economics, politics, society, development, the environment, and culture. My name is Paul Biska, and I'm joined today with my co-hosts, Michaela Karste and Johan Bjurman Bergman. Our guest today is Ambassador Steen Anderson. Steen, you have an impressive bio, so I'm just, just going to read it because it's important for our listeners and viewers to get to know the interesting things you've done. So Steen is today the Ambassador of Denmark to Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad, and Benin, based in Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso. An economist by training, he began his career as a local government economist and then started an NGO working on urban development issues and providing training to refugees in Denmark. Steen then worked for the European Union in India, Nepal, Bhutan, and the Philippines. In Indonesia, Steen was the Special Assistant to World Bank's Country Director while also serving as an education economist. Steen then continued his uh, work on education with the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, covering programs around the world, and was head of cooperation in Tanzania, at the time the largest bilateral program of Denmark. Steen returned to the World Bank, where he, was fo- where he focused on the bank's partnership, on fragile and conflict-affected states, with the UN in particular, but also increasingly with international NGOs. As Danish ambassador to the Sahel, Steen now has the chance to turn fragility and conflict policy and strategy into results on the ground with medium to large bilateral development programs in Burkina Faso and Niger. Ambassador Steen Sone Anderson, welcome to F-World. Thank you very much. And that all sounded really impressive when you just read it. (laughs) We didn't have to work hard for that. So let me start with um, a question that we always ask our guests. We want to know a bit about their story. So where did you grow up and what are the the places, people, ideas that have shaped your career that have brought you to where you are today? <laughs> okay, that, that is a really big question. Um, okay, let, let me be brief, but start from the beginning. I grew up in very rural Denmark in the Northwest. Uh, it's definitely the periphery of, of Denmark. Um, then again, there was not much to do, right? So you got to read a whole lot and then you could play football. That was about it. Um, little bit sort of moving fast forward. I, um, I did my economic studies primarily in, um, in Aarhus University, still in Jutland, but, you know, biggest city in Jutland at last. Um, and uh, partly I did studies uh, as Erasmus student in France. Again, you know, in the Northwest, not in Paris, but in Poitiers ancient capital but 800 years ago or so um the um i did actually manage to sort of do a refresher at london school of economics in uh, in development economics later so just to say that starting as just a regular micro macro economist i sort of homed in more on development economics along the way because i found it really interesting um i did not i think perhaps the first the first sort of larger choice that you make as an economist you could go many directions, right? All of the uh, most of the economists at my university they went to private sector, right? To banks, finance, etc., and they looked upon, let's say, us twenty five percent that did not. There were more sort of national economics, um, political economy, as dorks, right? Why would you want to make half as much money, uh, public sector salary, etc.? I can only say, which has been true ever since, that you know, intrinsic motivation matters, right? If you if you need to spend a lot of time working, then you'd better work for something that that you believe in to to make a positive difference. And uh, even if it doesn't always, then at least you can try. So so that was, I think, a de- defining choice. Uh, and um, let me stop there first. Maybe this is too much detail. Otherwise, you know, no, not too much detail. Okay. Um, so a bit later, and, no, and now I this, think it's great. Okay, a bit later, and this this obviously touches then a bit on the bio that you, that you mentioned. I um, my first job was as a as an economist for a local government, one of the larger provincial cities in in Denmark. Super interesting, actually very fulfilling as a sort of young economist. You get around all sorts of things, right, from education to health to you know just keeping track of public finances, etc. Um, and fairly close to citizens. It's a very interesting. Um, and I also then got involved in a major pilot project for EU structural funds. This now we're talking sort of late 90s where this was all the rage in in cities in Europe to could we please get some money from EU for in, for example urban development and um and we did and and won sort of a European competition around that and and this is where we 
I got sort of assigned for a couple of years to basically establish a partnership and uh, an NGO from scratch that was doing urban development, including the, let's say, the software and and focused very much around um, uh, refugee populations, especially women. How do we um, how do we do we integrate them in the labor market, which is actually still that is a that is a fair question in many developing countries these days, right? You know the 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 potential of women releasing that in terms of socioeconomic everything. So anyway, um, and I did also get a taste for international work at the time. I can I can see you talking, Paul, but I can't hear you. Um, so I'll, so I'll 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 finish there, sort of my my long lead into international uh, organizations and development work. <laughs> okay, which was um, which were, I just I just really enjoyed the the European exchanges. There was um, um, a lot of, of 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 funds actually allocated to experience um it was a pilot project so what do you do with international experience how do you share that and that's that was really interesting as a european experience with you know other cities were like ranged from barcelona to huddersfield uk to uh, to athens etc um and i figured okay i should i should get more I should do more of the international work and a presto I was um, the following job was then in India as a young expert with the European Commission and since then it has been about international development in various forms so you mentioned something that was um, two things that that struck me there and Michael and Johan I'm sure have their own sort of zillions of questions but you mentioned about the software that you you the, the NGO and the partnership you're looking at what do you mean by that I mean that you could do certainly at the time you could do you could look at urban development as being infrastructure, right? Let's take for example the World Bank and their engagement in 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 in, in urban development. There are massive hundreds of millions of dollars of investments, and I think the bank is getting better at adding software. But you know there can be way too much overbalance towards the infrastructure and not thinking about the other aspects. So that's what I mean. I mean that can easily include you know community building. What are the cultural uh, cultural values and activities that sort of bring people together? And that would that was as important. It was certainly took it was at least half the work, maybe not half the money, in terms of 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 the investments in such a project. But that's an example of the software. And then something else I had in mind was, so Denmark was getting structural EU funds in the 1990s. It's extremely hard to believe um, that Denmark, a country so developed, which is, you know, getting to Denmark the standard today in, in development parlance for many, many things. So why was that? <laughs> the, the getting to Denmark, I think, can have negative or positive connotations, for example, in an American context, depending on politics, right? But I agree. I take it as a positive in terms of the Nordic welfare society and model, right? Um, so at the time, um, at the, you're right, of course, it wasn't that most of the funds went to Denmark or Sweden, etc. But there was actually a, a chapter under the EU structural funds that were the periphery regions of even rich, developed, highly developed countries. And, uh, you know, the part of Jutland where I worked was, uh, was well, qualified. So it was still, it was a fraction of EU structural funds, but for these, for especially for, let's say, ex, uh, pilot projects with exchange of experience, it was important that you sort of got to all the, at that time, 25 countries, if I remember correctly. No, it was less because it was before the accession of of, of uh, Eastern Europe. My apologies to Eastern European colleagues. I forget how many countries it was, but it was all of them. <laughs> Fascinating. So, so from from that work in terms of um, you know supporting uh, development in 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 Denmark, um, which is much like the country I'm from, Sweden, you know, has a very strong welfare state tradition whereby the government really goes above and beyond to take care of the health and the well-being of of citizens uh, to now being in Burkina Faso and Mali which are two countries that are really at the epicenter of, of insecurity in the Sahel and um, and really faces a, a, lo a lot of challenges um, what would you say uh, are, are some of the transferable learnings that you could take from Denmark to countries like Mali and Burkina Faso, and how has the 
tradition of a welfare state informed kind of how a country like Denmark engages in in fragile states? Um, let me just start by Johan just saying that that so so the countries where I can claim a certain expertise is Burkina Faso and Niger, whereas our neighbors in Mali are very much our neighbors and very clear and present. But 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 it's the other two countries <laughs> that I spend most of my time on. Um, but it is a very good question, right? Because I would say on the positive side, it brings some of the um, it brings some of the values that I think. We are we're certainly proud of in the Nordic countries, right? In terms of equality, in terms of strong social protection, in terms of uh, uh, women as being, you know, equal to men. Even though I will admit that, you know, it's not a hundred percent right. Women still make less money than men, but it is as more or less as equal as it gets in the world currently. You can say so. A lot of those values and, and principles in a way is we take that with us right and and certainly working for a danish embassy with danish development policy that is embedded in what we do on the other hand i would also say and, and that is why it's a very good question we've also got to be careful right because we cannot we cannot transfer the models etc the idea of systems export we have tried i think both sweden and denmark have thought that was you know almost a religious belief at times that you know why shouldn't the rest of the world benefit from our model right and it doesn't always it often doesn't work very well i can as an example the trilateral negotiations in the labor market where the state that basically doesn't meddle, but you have the other parties, the employers and the employees, the trade unions, etc., that basically negotiate, etc. That doesn't travel very well, right? It's an extremely good model, and it's worked very, very well in in our Scandinavian countries. But it, it as a systems export, it hasn't worked very well. Just to give you an example, now that I think that that's that's incredibly interesting, and I want to pick up on something you said when it comes to social protection, which I think has become even more in the spotlight now during covid and 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 there is an immense increase in the amount of social protection that that countries both both rich and poor are doing so what is there anything that 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 the the, the countries like like niger and 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 burkina faso um can can learn from the from the nordic models in terms of social protection and um and and what are some of the pitfalls you would say in this in this area uh, because obviously you know it would be great we could we could reduce poverty by sending just money to people but what are the what are the challenges to to doing those kind of you know cash transfers that that are also quite popular at this point yeah that so so I'm certain that there are there is quite a lot that that countries in the Sahel could learn from our models, but they generally can't afford it for now. So so this is also why, perhaps, uh, let me give you two examples from here from this this re this very hot region where I'm sitting now, ra waiting for the rainy season to begin soon. I hope. Um, so, so one is that we do actually invest, and we do that jointly. Uh, with, there is a big, quite a big regional program of social protection in the Sahel, uh, which is implemented by the World Bank through governments, and we are pooling a number of bilaterals, you know, like Denmark, Germany, the UK, are pooling funds into this mechanism, and that is, I will say, the population in Burkina Faso has not seen a lot of CFA franc or dollars come out of that initiative yet that is in a way the long haul laying the groundwork the regulations etc sort of the public sector reform approach that the bank is 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 you know quite good at the world bank but it also takes a very very long time right so in that sense you know for that to make an impact in the near future i doubt it but is it a good idea and will it make a difference in perhaps three years time i hope so um but but what I feel quite strongly and, and what we put a lot of thought into here is what are then the existing social protection systems in a Sahel context? And both Niger and Burkina are among, well, among the 10 poorest countries in the world, right? 80% uh, of the population more or less work in, in and around agriculture, much of it subsistence agriculture. So social protection here, it's a family. It is the extended family and still most people still live in villages and as long as there's someone in your family 
even you know second cousins etc someone in your family that's making a salary that had and still has something left from the harvest etc you take care of each other it's an obligation and it's a it's a norm so in that sense here we we and we can get back to that later if if you're interested but we've actually tried to translate or interpret social protection into okay let's try and and turn our agricultural sector program here in the in a sense of insecurity and urgency that we have now you know humanitarian crisis that have exploded over the last two years in Burkina Faso let's try and and turn that into community resilience investments which is Partly, it's about uh, increasing productivity, pretty basic, low-tech stuff in communities, um, combining it with some, let's say, social cohesion, call it very local governance, community-level governance, um, and some and minor infrastructure stuff sort of to try and boost um, boost productivity. Obviously, if you have access to markets, if you have a chance of has access to market, it, it's more attractive than in some of the areas where you don't. Um, but just to say... I think the interpretation of social protection in 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 Niger and Burkina Faso now is really the extended families and the village level where in the dry season as we have now everybody is just trying to eke out the resources until the rains come here and you can see a harvest in four months time time in the horizon um so I hope there was there was sort of like a, at least a double answer to your question Johan and um actually sorry if I may jump in um, you said something interesting. Uh, the the model of social protection is the extended family. It's in a way, it's very traditional. It's uh, how we evolved as humans, right? It, it's the model that exists even in Eastern Europe, in parts, in very very rural parts, in a way. Um, I'm curious, actually. Can you tell us more? Just paint a picture for us. What are the main challenges these countries are facing, and maybe highlight what does fragility look like in these countries from the perspective that where you're sitting. Right. Okay, this is, uh, let me go for a two-minute answer and not a 30-minute answer, then I'll try at least. Take um, as long as needed. <laughs> These are complicated places. Um, okay, so so Burkina Faso and Niger, or, and in fact Mali as well, so the countries in the Sahel, they have not arrived at the position at the very, very bottom of any income table right they're among the very poorest countries in the world human development uh, indices are niger is literally 189 out of 189 in the index so it's bottom it's rock bottom right um and that is not that is not a sudden crisis that has brought us here that is decades and and you can argue whether it's before the end of 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 colonial rule by by france in this case um but you you know there's still 60 years of independence afterwards etc so countries have gone many in many directions but massive underdevelopment or or inefficient ineffective on in unequal development so um so you can say socioeconomics are <laughs> ready for a fragility and conflict, violent conflict erupting. If you have a vacuum, there's certainly a risk of something coming to fill that vacuum, right? So, so I I would probably argue that that Burkina Faso, let's take Burkina as an example, was also a fragile country before 2015, but it was it was it was, it was steady, it was stable. It had had a dictator for decades, Blaise Compaoré, and and had 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 lived in peace you know certainly not in 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 wealth and high development or anything but at peace coexistence if you will at very low levels now then comes an event if you will the event here was a revolution and the and the dictator uh, you know got deposed and fled the country and you started constructing a democracy which is this is not long ago right it is uh, it's 6 years ago it's not even 6 years ago um so so just to say now we see added to a fragile country with incredibly low development levels we see the catalyst right you see the you see the the spillover from mali that saw its own crisis earlier on and you know i won't call myself a mali expert but but you know 
I mean, you could you could certainly argue that Mali is indeed a failed state, right? With a uh, with a peacekeeping operation, etc., and half of the country, you know, lost control of that quite a long time ago, and not really regaining control. So those spillovers to the neighborhood, like Niger and Burkina Faso, it is a very very difficult neighborhood. So you had inflows of arms, lots of arms coming in from Libya traveling down through easily down through Niger, by the way, massive smuggling routes, which has been the livelihood of the north of Niger for hundreds of years. Um, and you see the extra catalysts, which have been, you know, trained jihadists, etc., coming in. We, I, I mentioned a vacuum. So, yeah, why not? It, is, it has been relatively easy to go in and get a position and uh, build local routes, etc., for jihadists. Um, and by now, you know, even two years ago, there might have been discussion that, you know, this was the foreigners, the, the people attacking, you know, violent conflict was foreigners. It wasn't us. It was not our people. That is no longer the story, right? It is it is an endogenous issue now. Recruitment is primarily of young Burkina Bay. And again, you could easily draw a parallel to, to Niger in this. Um, so just to say where, where we are now, it's been building up to that for <laughs> you know, certainly for many decades, and you see a catalyst and the explosion. And in this case, for Burkina, they started almost from scratch in 2015, right? With a new democracy, a new government. There was a counter coup. There was a coup by the presidential guard, the Republican guard, uh, which was stopped by the regular army, but it also meant that the elite core of the army, with all of the intelligence services, was disbanded. You know, in self in self defense, they were disbanded, and you started from scratch, um, and that has been a rude, difficult awakening, right? So, um, I know you're. I went into the sort of practical examples, and you asked, you know, what is fragility for me? But it's just to say that, in addition to to massive underdevelopment for a long time, it is it is also social. It is social cohesion. It is the social contract, and in this case, if you've had, if you've had you know, maybe not half the population, but a large part of often the periphery, right? Ethnic minorities that have been um, outside of power, outside of any power sharing arrangement for a long time and, and have lots of reason to question the legitimacy of the state. You know, you have the recipe for that catalyst arriving. Um, and I mean, maybe we can, maybe that's a different question, but but it's also important to talk about resilience, right? What what structures do exist? And I would say, you know, the coexistence between religious faiths, tribe, well, ethnicities uh, has been has been extremely strong for many years. And it's still, you know, there's still a lot of that left, but 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 those what do you call that those those schisms within populations in terms of ethnicities, we see that. We see that increasingly in European countries, even in Sweden and Denmark, we see that with immigrant populations, etc., the homogeneity of even our populations is also challenged, right? So that that is a whole different ball game in terms of, you know, post-colonial Africa, whether it is in the West or the Center or the or the East. Um, so. Yeah, that, perhaps I should stop there, Michaela. But just to say that, yeah, it's a complex question. But I do think that the the inclusion and the 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 inclusion and and the state legitimacy is the basis, or the lack of that rather, is the basis for what we've been seeing. So, in a way, we've we've you can you can be a fragile without having an explosion of violent conflict. But here, you you have both in the Sahel. It's interesting. So I, I wanted to pick up again, uh, going back to the social contract that you mentioned. So what? how would you characterize the, the current social contract in place in a place like, like Burkina Faso? Because obviously, you know, as, as a general idea, we think of it as, you know, a transaction between the, the state and the, the, the citizens and there is taxation. And, you know, this is the, the model way of it. But as you mentioned, obviously, it might look very, very different when you the, the, the base of the social protection is the family rather than the state. And so how would you characterize the, the, the social contract uh, if you if you perceive that that there is one that's currently kind of in force keeping society together? Well, there is. Let's say there is a there is a really asymmetric social contract, right? There is there is um 
So again, let, let, let's stay with Burkina then, because otherwise it also gets complicated to branch out to all kinds of examples. But, but in this country, um, you do have just over half of the population uh, that is of, of the ethnic Mossi. Um, and, uh, and they have always held political power because they are a majority and ethnicity does matter. Uh, we there was a recent election in Niger. There was a recent election in Burkina as well. But at the recent election in Niger, there was um, the, the the current the new president, uh, President Basum, is actually of ethnicity Arab, that which is highly unusual. But it is also um, an extra challenge if you're a politician and you're not from the uh, from the ethnic major majorities. So anyway, so getting back to, I, I would say for the for the the center of Burkina Faso with 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 Mossi majority etc., you know that the social contract is is pretty much intact. I would say, except of course, being challenged by attacks from jihadists, from bandits, from criminals. You can say. Security and justice is being massively challenged for everyone, right? And that is in 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 really old days, also in Europe, when there was state building going on in Europe, right? You had an army and you built some roads so the army could get out and assure security, right? Relatively fast. Really, really basic. And then you would have, you know, in the feudal system, you would contribute some soldiers or some knights or whatever you had. Um, so the really basic contract is that, and you can see even the basic basic elements is under serious threat, right? You could say a third of the country is, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that the, that, that the government has lost control, but they're certainly not in control. No one is in control, you can say, of many areas. And specifically, perhaps the more attractive smuggling routes, north, south, and, and uh, west, east. Uh, but it, in addition to that, there are, of course, expectations of education, of at least basic health, you know, primary health clinics. Um, and I would say justice as well, even though this is this is probably a whole new question in terms of modern justice systems based on, in this case, on, on French traditions, right? French public management systems, justice systems, etc. That is that is a major undertaking to construct such 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 a system. Whereas you come from customary structures with with village chiefs, village elders, um, and you know you 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 don't have we don't have that figured out, right? The 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 modern or the the, the Western image, if you will, adapted of course to local context, is not functioning. It is it is not properly in place. So it means that you can you can wait years and years and years for justice. So let's say uh, a land conflict, which is very common, right? Uh, it will take you years, and eventually. Even if you try and solve that through customary means, which you will, you know, custom mediation with sort of village councils, etc., is still certainly done and can be relatively efficient if everybody respects it. But if you get into an asymmetric power system with, you know, a, a, a wealthy uh, a private businessman from one of the major cities that come in and he doesn't accept it, and he goes into sort of formal the formal justice system, then then you get a problem, right? And you had have immediately a perception of injustice, and you know perhaps not just a perception. It often turns out to be that. Um, but just to finish back on on regular social services, right? So so the so the the big social sectors, education, health, water. Oh, you can't really survive without water. Water is also turned into a flashpoint in the Sahel. You know, under under threat, it was it was already difficult, right? It is the, one of the hottest areas in the world, with desertification creeping in. Sahara is just on the doorstep, um, and you have massive demographic growth. Niger is, has the world re record, unfortunately, in demographic growth, doubling every 20 years the population. Uh, Burkina Faso is a little, little after that, right? Um, Three percent growth per year, but just to say that, and combined with climate change, which is not, I, I, I hope the discussion is almost over about is there a climate change or not? Because in the Sahel, it's pretty damn clear, and it's not new, right? It has been, it's incremental. But it has been going on for 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 a, for a while. I mean, if you talk to local farmers, etc., they will say, "Yeah, yeah, ten years ago it was better, etc." And I know farmers complain around the world, but 
this is this is based on facts as well. So just to say that you are truly under threat in terms of the scarce resources, right? And and again, in the cities, the towns, the prevent provincial capitals, you can you have a you do have education offered, right? Once you get to villages, more in the in in the periphery of the country. And in some cases for the, the nomadic people like the Pearl that primarily live towards the north, also spe- especially afflicted by violent conflict and attacks, you you can ha- you you will see a discussion that yeah, but it's a, is it cultural norms that they don't want to go to schools, or is it because there there are no quality schools? I mean, there are certainly no quality schools in any case. So again, <laughs> I could have answered even longer, Michaela, but 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 yeah, the. Um, the social contract was never there for all parts of the country. And, you know, the, the, the neglect of the perimeter of the country. This is something you can have an, you can have an intense discussion with, with politicians about, you know, was there such a neglect or not? Personally, I think it's clear that it was there under the development for a long time. So um, I was thinking as you were speaking, especially about the population growth. So you have a country... That's about the size, the population is about the size of Romania. However, it's about 20 million. Um, One of the poorest countries in the world with the least amount of schooling. And I was thinking, I actually looked up this information as you were speaking, because I was curious, what was the population in 1960? I don't know. And (laughs) it was 4.8 million. Mm -hmm. And uh, because you mentioned, just like Niger, Niger is uh, the record holder right now in population growth in the youth bulge, right? And um, Burkina Faso is following close behind. Um, Obviously, strained resources, increase in population, insecurity, lack of governance, lack of trust within society. Where do we start? Well, uh, because the, the, the number of problems seems overwhelming. However... Um, and if we're going, we as an international community, we're going to help countries like Burkina Faso. Where do we start, and where where does Denmark think it should start based on its own limited resources? Because we have both limited financial resources globally, limited human resources, limited amount of time. Unfortunately, there's a lot of constraints. So if I'm looking at this complex system, which is very chaotic, with a lot of moving pieces. Um, and a lot of constraints. How do I optimize and where, where do I get my 80% for the 20%? The 20% input, 80% of the, the impact, in your, in your view. Well, f- first of all, obviously, for a, for a country like Denmark, even if, you know, even if we're, we're a, a middle to large player in, in these con- the countries where we are, we're still a significant player in size, right? But much smaller than, for example, the World Bank, right? And and a small part of the whole. So in that sense, even if we can see problems all around that someone should really do something about, we also have to accept that, you know, we are not going to be able to fix it all. And, you know, if we try, we will fail, probably fail all around. So, so by now we have um, sort of as general rules, we try and focus on three broad thematics right in any place where we are to try and assure that we have the capacity and we have a certain scale so we can make a difference so so in in this country um of Burkina Faso and I will be honest and say that when I came uh, as new ambassador etc before arriving I had I had a sort of at the back of my head shouldn't we be doing education you know i i for me girls education if you could that. if you could choose just one proxy for good development and and successful development i would say completion of girls secondary education right if you could do that you would have done so many things right but that's also Even why it's quite difficult school at the very least sorry i'm I keep, i'm going to cut in but if, what you've just said is so crucial right because we know how much human capital is linked to fragility yeah but absolutely, um, no. I'm I'm happy. You know, functioning primary school. I'm happy to take that as well. But then you have, you know, then you have the the transition to secondary school where you lose most of the girls, right? So anyway, well, let's we can, if if we want to sort of have a discussion of level of ambition, I'll take primary education first. That's okay. But in any case, 
so so coming here i should say that that i used to work in this region actually in uh, 10 years ago between 2007 and 2011 as an education economist uh, in based in copenhagen i was overseeing um, education sector programs in burkina faso in benin that were then as let's say global or Danish development prioritization was turned multilateral. All of the money for education practically goes into multilateral institutions, you know, global partnership for education, education cannot wait, uh, UNICEF, etc. But just to say that I still had, you know, is this right? You know, shouldn't we be in education even if we closed here, you know, six years ago? Um, and let's pretend that, you know, I could get everybody, including political powers, uh, back home to accept that. Um, but then coming here and seeing exactly, you know, coming back to your point and your question, just how many challenges there are, then, well, actually, water, the water sector, and especially um, water as a flare point, as a pivot de conflict, what so a driver of conflict is right up there together with the land conflicts, right? It's uh, so in that sense, the idea of in the, with the current let's say threat amplifiers of demography, of climate change, etc. If we were to fall too much behind on water, etc., you can just see violence erupt all around, you know, uh, and especially the, the flare points between nomadic populations needing water for their cattle, the, the farmers, agriculture, etc. Um, and of course, you need drinking water to stay alive. Uh, so just to say that, that with the angle we've been in we've been in the water sector here for a long time right and and we still haven't achieved you know 100% coverage of the population um we may never achieve it but we have improved it quite a lot so now in terms of basically what and now now I will I will sway into a bit so so you know what is Denmark actually doing i'm hoping that we will sign a new 5 year country program between Burkina Faso and Denmark in two weeks time. So so we've spent a lot of time on that the last year, year and a half. So for the first time here, we've actually changed. Now this gets a little nerdy perhaps, right? But in terms of programming and results frameworks, etc., the overall obje development objective for us here now is stabilization and prevention of violent conflict. Then your choices in terms of strategic objectives below that kind of depend on how do you achieve that most effectively? Or how do you believe that you can achieve that most effectively? And this is where we, we decided, okay, water is... Um, water is incredibly important in the Sahel. It's for life, for for uh, for women in terms of how much time they they waste on just trudging back and forth for water. For uh, of course productivity in agriculture, so livelihoods. Um, in any case, that that was that remains our biggest investment area here. Would we love to also invest in education? Yes, but you know you got to choose in a way. You got to prioritize. Second strategic objectives where we stay engaged and we adjust to the security context that are here that is here now security and justice i will just say this is extremely hard work this is where you know you don't declare success in a year right arguably we've spent four or five years in this country after the revolution of constructing the basics of a of a new uh, justice system the security sector where much larger countries than Denmark are engaged, like France, the U.S., uh, with their, let's say, their their approaches and much more hardware than Denmark could bring to bear uh, ever, we engage in terms of sort of institutional reform um, at the Ministry of Security and a strong focus on training and in human rights, basically trying to. We started with um, with a conflict um, analysis, right? In terms of what are the top drivers of conflict, and it is no it's no surprise that land conflict, water conflict, conflicts over natural resources, um, but also impunity and abuses of security uh, forces is um, is way up there, not least among the minorities in and in, in the in the periphery of the country. So. That is that's quite a decision in terms of also reputational risk. Do you engage or do you disengage? Right. 
and and that's probably one of some of the hardest decisions in terms of programming to take there are no there are no easy quick results there are no easy wins here and you have massive risk in terms of reputation on the other hand you've got to stay engaged right and that is i mean that has also been approved at the highest level into into so so we are we are engaged and we are in a way responsible not in the first line but but we choose to stay despite at the end of 2020 there were more people more civilians killed to the north of Burkina Faso by security forces than by jihadists and that is that is a uh, um a terrible fact um i'm actually curious i'm going to take you back to the water give us a couple examples because as soon as you start talking about security I immediately before you mentioned that it, uh, obviously water conflict is one of the the big factors how do you invest Danish resources on the water front, and how does that connect back to the security? If you have any examples, mm-hmm, I do. I have. I have one very good example. I think so. Um, so there is massive uh, investment in infrastructure in the water sector, right? When it comes down to it, especially in a place like this, hell, you need to build massive reservoirs, collect rainwater. Some places you need to drill, and it can be hundred meters deep before you hit water. Some places, right? And then you build the networks and turbo in, in, to distribute it. So much of the money goes into into infrastructure, of course, um, but there is also a, a large part that goes into what's called SHIR, that would be in English, Integrated Water Resource Management. And that is many things. But one of them is in terms of adaptation, in terms of climate change, um, which has been, I mean, that has been coming, right? Even 10 years ago, the countries here certainly started thinking about what do we do? What do we do with water resources to try and invest in resilience, if you will, to try and and start to adapt? But also in terms of a direct link to security, and and that comes back to my point that there are systems for coexistence here, right? Also between water users. So there are some excellent models, actually, of uh, local water water user committees, often formed around the large dams, so the reservoirs. That is basically you collect as much. You have massive rain downpour of 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 water here, right? Over three months in the summer, more than in Sweden and Denmark, for example. But then you have nothing for the rest of the year. Uh, so basically, you need to manage that, and you need to manage it together. Otherwise, you have this, you know, classic problem that you know it from old westerns, from the U.S., right? You know, the farmers and the cattle came in and drank it all, etc. Now here, you do have that as well, right? So they have local water uses have um committees it's linked up to local governments as well uh, so there is you can say the government at deconcentrated level is engaged and they set their own rules and they 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 mediate if you will and they may define that okay there are two months here this is crunch time for um for what you call that for for planting season for example sowing and planting etc so give priority to the farmers, etc., so they can water as much as possible in this period, and that has been that is literally local level mediation around a specific theme and quite successful. It's something that we would like to see. Basically, take it. It's not everywhere, but it's quite well known, well used in many regions, etc. To amplify that as much as possible would be great. If you can take that type of model and apply it to other sectors and thematics as well, it would be interesting. But I think it's a good concrete example of where local structures, traditional sort of mediation practice, etc., comes into its own. I'm quite, I mean, I can't take credit for it well, but but we're we're supporting it as much as we can. So Steen, Mihala took you to water, and I'm gonna take you back to fighting. And, and so you mentioned the risk analysis part and, and the fact that you, on the one hand, have to provide uh, more support for safety. I think Denmark is supporting Takuba, the, the, the operation. Maybe you can tell us more about that and Force Barkan. But generally, um, when you look at development aid, you have some markers of success, whether they are granular enough or good enough. But how do you look at Denmark's support for security sector and and for security and justice in the Sahel? And what are generally your markers of success? And how do you basically make this this balancing act between, yes, gaining operational efficiency on the ground, so ensuring that those schools that you mentioned do not shut down because of insecurity, but then also ensuring that that support does not translate into human rights violations and impunity? 
Okay, you guys, you have excellent questions. Um, <laughs> so this, this is a very good question as well. Let's um, perhaps I can introduce a concept that we can come back to here. In in in, I mean, you obviously know it well, and we worked on it together, Paul, uh, on the uh, the humanitarian development peace building nexus, right? And and as an organizing concept in terms of the different actors, the different types of of instruments you need to bring to bear to a really really complicated. Uh, challenge it's i i like to use that actually in terms of trying to operationalize what is it then we can do but so then take the p and we haven't the peace building side peace and security rather um then then yes as you mentioned only i believe three weeks ago um the Danish Parliament approved a Danish contribution to uh, to Takupa, which is you know special forces. That is that is very that is the very sharp end of military, if you will. Even if the Danish contribution is a small contribution compared to uh, you know a fifty times larger contribution by France, that is the core. But I think, <clears throat> I mean, that is very much a reflection of accepting that this is a joint prop this is a joint problem right i mean the insecurity in the sahel and with the potential impact in terms of terrorism attacks in europe in terms of migrant uh, illegal migration refugee flows down the line etc that we can't we can't just stand back from that because we're to the north of europe right even though it might be tempting um so so it is it is um it is a willingness to use all of the instruments here, and uh, that is then based in Mali. Uh, but but operational area includes the north of uh, Niger and and of uh, Burkina Faso. So yes, the remit is contributing to stabilization, but but also you know there's there's no very nice way of saying this, but but to hunt down bad guys, right? Um, as from the numbers I have seen so far, actually, um, and and any reports, etc., the Operation Barkhane, uh, which is you know, Takuba Special Forces will be affiliated with, with that, is affiliated with that, is under that umbrella, have not been accused of human rights violation. It's at least it's been very very limited and and not proven. And from what I hear in the field, if there are, I mean. Estonian, French, uh, or in the future, maybe Danish soldiers along, security forces are actually behaving, military forces, I should say, are behaving quite well. Um, and I'm not saying that's not a guarantee that we could easily, you know, get all kinds of accusations and and also, you know, uh, bad uh, situations coming down the line. But in any case, I just wanted to say that in terms of, of human rights violations, etc., hasn't actually been associated with the international contingents, at least not yet. MINUSMA is obviously there, there as well, right, with more of a, a DPO mandate and, and for Mali only, um, to a certain frustration for the other countries that think that huge investments are going into MINUSMA, which is peacekeeping in Mali. But, you know, Niger and Burkina Faso don't always think that, hmm, maybe um, could we get some of those resources maybe in G5, which is the regional collaboration for all five countries? Um, anyway, perhaps I digress, but just to say that is that is a contribution, perhaps a small contribution, but others, I believe Sweden has also um, has also approved a contribution to Takuba again. So, so, so even the North European countries are, you know, entering that alliance, if you will, for security. But with, I, I'm not sure that this is sort of an official version of, you know, what is the objective here? What is what is the success indicator? Um, my own view. And that's sort of in a personal context, if you will. My own view is that it's buying time, right? It is it is buying time, stabilizing and holding the countries together as much as possible to give the states a chance to build capacities. And that includes actually the training of security forces so they don't act abusively and with impunity towards civilian populations to regain control over their own territories. Um, but nobody says... I have heard no one say that that you can gain a military victory here. Nobody believes that. It won't. 
it, it doesn't come on its own. It comes together with the longer investment. And, and it will start with the capacity development in the security sector, I think. At the same time, the security sector is incredibly opaque, right? It is hard to, um, you know that better than most, Paul, in terms of data, how much transparency are you willing to accept in your security sector? And quite old fashioned bureaucracies in terms of security sector reform, <clears throat> That is a nice thing as a concept, but it is glacially slow, the reform part of it, often. Um, maybe I, I, maybe you'd want to pose additional questions on the security angle, because I'm otherwise all sorts of things that we could get into in terms of the triple nexus, right? How do you, how do you link that up to some of the softer investments in social cohesion, civil society, uh, let's say some of the softer parts of security, in my view. And, and often that is where we as a large development partner can come in more than with military hardware, to be honest. Steen, the, the conversation about this can take us days and hours. So let's maybe tackle, I mean, it's fascinating and, and we should definitely do a follow up on that. But um, let's go to something, uh, something else right now. So as we're talking about, um, you know, the Nordic countries, Denmark, Sweden and, and various other countries committing funding to to the, the security sector and, and just in general committing resources. Um, I think it's interesting uh, and something that, you know, I think we don't discuss enough perhaps. Um, it's how do we make the case to the taxpayer in a country like Sweden or Denmark or Europe or other donor countries for, the, for that matter uh, to, uh, to invest in, uh, in these countries? And what is the what is the way that you would convince the Danish average Danish taxpayer that investing your hard earned Danish kona in uh, Burkina Faso is the right thing to do? Right. Well, that that's not. It's generally not my personal job to do that, right? But it is it is a precondition for us being able to do our do the work that we do here, right? So, so I would say. I would. I think it is actually very similar in, um, in 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 let's say the Nordic countries in terms of the the development and and the shift that has also taken place over time. I would say 20 years ago, there was still a very large percentage of the uh, you know majority of the population. There is still a majority now, but it is smaller than it used to be. That we should uh, share the wealth, right? We should globally also share the wealth and redistribute, etc. Extremely poor people in the world. It's shameful that we don't try to help them. That was sort of the uh, and and you know you can go into all kinds of of discussions about altruism, um, but but there was uh, there was a purpose on its own from the global redistribution. I think you know it is unfair, and we should also help the very very poorest countries. Then it came into also arguments around trade, right? You know, if we if global economics are developed, it's going to be to the benefit of everybody, and trade flows will be good for our own countries and whatnot. That was also now I think I'm sort of fast forwarding to where we are now, and certainly and have been in the last. What should we say, Paul? The last last ten years, perhaps, when we've really seen global conflict, displacement, etc., explode to levels we haven't seen before. Well, not since the Second World War. Um, the um, I think the the arguments now are are much more um, how do you, are getting quite concrete, right? And they're getting a lot a lot closer to home. Let me put it like that. In terms of the 2015, where you're in Europe, you saw more than a million refugees sort of on the roads, walking along the high road, sometimes, you know, talking to nice police officers, etc. But that was a shock. You know, politically speaking, that was a shock to Europe. And that did start a change, I think, in perception in terms of how close is actually Africa to Europe, even to the north of Europe. Um, so illegal migration refugees migration and and you get into you get into easily into difficult discussions around you know migration as a you know economic driver that has over thousands of years been a positive towards illegal migration and refugees etc how do you control that and the and the, the the global bads public bads that are linked up to that and secondly of course you have terrorism i don't think there is well there are a few countries that have not lived through terrorist attacks i mean we certainly have in denmark 
And that means that that from a prevention angle, frankly, investment in prevention in terms of massive unregulated illegal migration flows potentially and uh, uncontrolled jihadism that sort of takes root yet again. We've seen it before in the Middle East, right? We've seen it in, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, etc. We've seen global coalitions around that. Could that happen again in Sahel if we left it? It probably could, and it would be very close to parts of Europe. So, I mean, is that how I would convince the average Dane? I would probably... I would probably frame it a little bit differently, but I think there are some 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 clear factors of self-interest that are necessary to address from for, for European governments. Um, I hope that was an answer. I think this might be the last question um, based on based on time, but I'd love to go back to education. You spend a lot of time looking at education as an education economist, um, and ultimately. Why do we care in development about education is because it's one of those assets that once you build it, it's hard to destroy it. Meaning, you know, you can build a well and it can get destroyed in conflict, but you can build some learning, some knowledge in kids, in adults, and it stays. And which is why no matter what stage of development you're at, uh, human capital and education are just basics for moving forward. I am very curious to hear from your experience around the world. What do we get right about education development efforts and what do we get wrong? What are the things, if you had the power, let's say you are now king of education around the world, you have unlimited powers, what would you do differently and what would you keep the same? Now, that that I, the first thing that comes to mind is is really not the super optimistic answer. That is that education is one of the most complicated systems you can build, right? If you want to build a well-functioning education system, it goes from, you know, civil service reform, deployment of teachers, teach training, the inputs from, you know, getting textbooks in time, building the infrastructure so that there are less than 100 kids in each classroom. I mean, literally, there are hundreds of kids in the classrooms, many places here. It's seeing it live is is daunting. Um, so, but with that caveat, you know, could anyone fix that quickly? I doubt it. Um, but with that caveat, I think, I think we have come some ways actually. I, I think if you looked at the education for all initiatives that sort of came with the um, um, millennium development goals, right? And that was very much focused on access. That actually came a very, very long way in terms of getting many more kids into schools, building a whole lot of schools. Um, and there was billions of dollars or euros or whatnot in investments. What we got, I mean, I was part of this. What we got wrong was that in terms of getting public mobilization of funds for for a very attractive goal of of a just goal of Education for all, for all children should have a right to go to school. I mean, we say that they do, but they don't all, right? Um, was the quality aspects, which is what, if, if you want sustainability in education system, and if you want to take it, you know, to get the last hundred million of kids into school, then you also have to demonstrate that it's not a waste of their time to be in school. And in some cases, we've we've got to admit that it was, right? You had, you know, ghost teachers never showing up, poorly trained. You, you didn't receive any kind of a quality education in many, many, many schools. So you could almost say that 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 parents would be, I hate to say it, would in some cases be right to say, you know, my 10-year-old daughter can help me in the house instead of wasting her time in school doing nothing. So that is the next step, right? And getting in, you know, the technicalities we could discuss for a long time. How do you focus? What are the, what are the, what are the outcomes? How do you measure it? Is it early reading? How do you measure that you're on track from the early years? Because if you're not, you won't be able to construct the later years and the secondary schooling if you don't if you don't start from 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 the from the bottom. Um, so I think I think we've we've learned from our. I mean, it's harsh to call it a mistake, right? It was well-intentioned, but it was a partial. It, it was only a part of the problem that we addressed, and it wasn't a sustainable system that we managed to build. Um, but still, and, and of, of course, I have to say here in Sahel, 
that that global goal, I think almost everybody can agree that every single child should have a right to schooling, right, to learning, that that in order for us to achieve that is going to come back to the 30 odd countries conflict fragility affected, especially in Africa, there will be the laggards there, right? If we don't manage to achieve it here, for example, in the Sahel, Central Africa, we won't achieve that goal, right? And so even if you make me king of education for 10 years, if if I were, I would target the um, I would target the fragile countries as much as possible. But you also then get into I met, I met with the education minister here in Bukiza you know, recently. You know what? What if you then have built the schools and you have you know two thousand schools closed anyway because it's insecure, and your teachers are targeted and some of them get burned down as symbols of the state. You know the challenge in these in these countries is immense. But but you know we're not giving up. Um. I had another question. It wasn't, uh, that wasn't my last one. I just realized when it comes to you, you, we started early on in this conversation talking about, um, inclusion of women, girls, women in the workplaces, right? Uh, girls in schools. What is the biggest obstacle? Are we, have we figured out how to get girls in schools, beyond the financial resources, I'm talking about culturally, I'm talking about, you know, are those schools that um, teach girls more targeted? We know that the U.S. is going to withdraw out of Afghanistan, and there's an expectation, right, that girls and girls' education is going to suffer. Um, can you speak a little bit about your experience, at least in Burkina and Niger, about girls' education? Yes. Um, I th I think. Well, okay, there is a stated policy priority, actually from both presidents of both countries, that uh, education for girls is a top priority. The new president, Basum of Niger, actually made that a key point of his um, inauguration speech, girls' education. This needs to be a priority, and this is part. This is partly also linked to the demographic growth, right? That I mean, you you quickly come into the socio socioeconomic benefits of girls' education that are truly immense and and all studies and analysis show it um in it if you want to deal with you know doubling your population every 18 20 years etc you've got to be investing in girls education it is about it is partly about keeping girls in school longer it is also it's also about turning them into let's say productive agents that are independent as an economic agent it's half your population that's not producing exactly their capacity. Ex exactly um but this also this also is an investment in prevention actually of early child marriage if you are a, if you have a 14 year old girl at home etc and if it's not very productive anyway. It says, you know, marry, marry her away. I mean, and this then comes into the norms and the cultures, right? Since again, centuries, literally, where. Um, so, so I started out by saying this is a stated policy priority of the leaders, the 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 the, the, the leaders of the of the countries here. Um, but you're also up against norms norms and cultural traditions etc so so let's be honest i mean talking about generational change is the minimum right it may be intergenerational change that you're talking about and i am convinced that certainly two measures maybe the most important is girls education i think second is we come back to 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 justice to the law Right where we have actually seen, I would praise Burkina Faso for actually introducing quite progressive uh, legislation around sexual rep reproductive rights of women, around um, uh, feminine mutilation, um, which is terrible, terrible from our values, right? But there's also traditions that have been undertaken for centuries. So it, that is firmly legal. Has it been eradicated, the practice? Not yet. But it's just to say this is this is where I think I do think that a generation from now we will be in a better place in terms of the norms as long as you still have you know progressive legislation and you have a will and they mean it the leaders that they want to pursue it. Uh, 
but I don't believe we will be there in 10 years. And I still think that, that without education of girls, it will be, <laughs> we won't be moving as much. Uh, as you're speaking, I'm thinking, well, when you have even just mothers that have finished basic eighth grade, like good eighth grade or a 12th grade, their sons are going to be far less likely to go join various groups um, to stay in school. They, they pass on, right? Because women raise both the girls and the boys and they pass on different norms, different values with each generation. And that's how the change took place in our countries, in Europe. In, in Denmark, if you're thinking, going back enough hundreds of years and in Romania more recently, but it was sort of the same cycle. That is interesting you say that. I had, I had this conversation with a Burkina Bay doctor, a lady yesterday, um, and... Uh, just a second, Sina. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and she was saying, like, we were talking about gender-based violence, and it was a, it was a, it was a couple of Bukina Bay ladies and I at swim practice, and we were having a chat. Right? They were saying, um, they were saying, you know, we don't see that. We don't see that in our families. They're very aware of it in terms of the norms and traditions. Right? That, you know, that that gender-based violence, you know, especially between uh, between husband and wife, right, is very common. The statistics in terms of how many women were beaten within the last 12 months, I mean, it's more than half, it's closer to two-thirds, I believe. And even worse, if you're talking about norms, Mihaila, about two-thirds of them thought that, you know, it was... Um, it was okay because they had, you know, hadn't looked up properly after the kids, so they'd burn the dinner or something. So, just to say, just how much there is to change there. But their points, the two Burkina Bay ladies, was that in their well-educated families, even their extended families, this did not happen as far as they were aware of, etc. Because these were the norms, and the boys were also educated, the girls were also educated. They knew well how to behave, and if they did not behave properly, there would be consequences. But this, they also. Said it is perhaps true for 3%, 5% of the population, if we're lucky, just to say that it, that is another example of the incremental change, but that's the direction we'd like to see, right? Yeah, no, and, and, and that's, uh, that, that's an incredibly important topic, which, I, which I, we do hope to see development on. But as we're about to wrap up here, I just wanted to look a little bit to the future. And from your point of view, Steen, where you're sitting today as the ambassador, um, for Denmark to these countries, what would be your three top priorities for the next five to ten years? Um, you know that that you would want to really focus energy and 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 resources on. Well, I would perhaps I would come back to. I mean, I'm not going to pretend that it's a linear problem, right? But but I do think that there is this sense of urgency now that unless you manage to unless you manage to stabilize the countries unless you manage to regain to in a way that comes back to strengthening the capacities of your own security forces and that is not just the military that is your gendarmerie that is the police as well unless you've got to you've got to let's say strengthen that capacity in terms of gradually regaining better control of your territory and that is that is an urgency. I think if we're discussing scenarios of what might happen, if that, if we're not successful, I say we are not successful in that, you might not have that nation, those states in five or 10 years, right? So if we do achieve that, if we do manage to have that, that gradually, um, that, 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 let's say that, that stabilization, which is by, by definition, temporary right what do you use that rep reprieve for so the stabilization in in a way the security side of things to regain control and and that goes with i mean that goes with also proper behavior right proper training and behavior so you do not abuse your civilian population and create even more conflict in a way because that is a risk um but secondly then then it is and, and this maybe this sounds a bit like textbook, right? If you're if you're working on, uh, you know, pathways for peace, investing in conflict prevention, etc. But nevertheless, I I do think that the state legitimacy. I mean, proving that to your population, to and and especially to the parts of your population in the peripheries that have been underserved for a long time. I would also say this is what again for Burkina Faso. This is actually what the government 
is trying to do and in the um under g5 and you know some of the the political discussions and agreements about njamina and roadmaps for how do we move forward there is discussion of a military search but accompanied by a civilian search and that is investment in development right that is also demonstrating to the populations that we can secure the areas again and we can we can ensure the services the basic services and and the role of the state in providing for the population. And thirdly, and lastly, I do think that the, so on inclusion, youth is, I mean, that's the recruitment ground, right? That is the breeding ground for for, for new terrorists and bandits, because there are as, ma- as much criminals and bandits as, as it is jihadists here, right? So if you have no other options, if you have no future, someone will offer you $100 at Kalashnikov and a motorcycle, what why would you not take it there is nothing else you have no other chances etc i do think that 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 becomes i mean can we can we deal with that in 3 years we can maybe start but that takes some very very targeted interventions also by the government but also accompanied by us so yeah those would be the three those it would be the security and it would be the legitimacy of the state through the services and it would be, be inclusion and not least of the young people. Um, can we do that successfully in three years? Let's see. We will try. Well, that was a certainly fascinating conversation. And thank you so much, Ambassador Steen Sony Anderson, for joining us at FWorld. I think you've definitely proven that to be an ambassador, a good ambassador in a fragile state, you need to be part education expert, part fragility expert, part security expert, uh, macroeconomist uh, turn water specialist, and all of the above. So good for Denmark that it has people like you on the ground to make a difference. And to our listeners and viewers, thank you so much for turning into FWorld, the fragility podcast. We hope you found the conversation interesting and inspirational. Please subscribe where you listen to podcasts. If you want to know more about FWorld, please visit our website, f-world.org, and follow us on Twitter at FWorld Podcast. Thanks for listening and watching.